Hey guys, welcome to the UNC Neurosurgery Med Student Primer Series. I'm Marty Piazza, I'm one of the neurosurgery residents, uh, and we're finishing up with part three of our traumatic brain injury set. Um, previously, we talked about some definitions in part one, and then part two, we talked about um, specific hemorrhage patterns. And today, uh, we're gonna talk about skull fractures, DAI, and then uh, managing patients with TBI. And obviously, this is not gonna be exhaustive, but it'll hopefully give you a basic foundation. So skull fractures are commonly seen in traumas as well, especially in pediatric uh, TBIs. Um, there are different types. Uh, there's linear, depressed, there's open, and there's skull-based fractures. Oftentimes, the linear fractures uh, that are non-depressed um, will not require surgical treatment, and we just treat those symptomatically. Um, however, uh, depressed skull fractures and open depressed skull fractures often require surgical intervention. Uh, the general rule of thumb with the depressed fractures is that if the depression is equal to or greater than the width of the skull bone itself, um, surgical correction uh, is required um, for elevation. Additionally, if the fracture is open um, or uh, there's a laceration right over the fracture exposing intracranial contents to air, um, you need to give broad spectrum antibiotics for at least 24 hours. And we use Vancef and Flagyl for this, and then um, they'll also need surgical correction if it's indicated. So basilar skull fractures are breaks in the bone at the base of the skull. Um, they can be quite complicated, uh, but briefly, just a couple of points. Um, they uh, are caused by substantial blunt force trauma. Um, they usually involve the temporal bones, um, but they can also involve the occipital sphenoid, ethmoid, um, orbital plates, and frontal bones as well. Um, some physical exam findings, which you may remember from um, your uh, board examinations as medical students, um, are raccoon eyes, as you can see in this middle picture here, and then battle sign on the right, um, which is where there's um, uh, some uh, bruising and behind the ears of the mastoid. Patients may also have CSF rhinorrhea or otorrhea or hemotympanum or laceration of the external auditory canal. So DAI is a form of severe TBI um, that's quite complicated, but uh, basically uh, it's a, caused by a shearing force um, that's a result of the acceleration and deceleration of the brain tissue. Uh, it's often cited as the cause of loss of consciousness in patients that are immediately comatose after an injury uh, in the absence of a space-occupying lesion on a head CT. Um, but it can coexist with a space-occupying lesion like a subdural or an epidural, like we talked about in the previous lectures. Uh, DAI can be difficult to diagnose on initial CT, um, but generally the teaching is it is suspected um, when there's loss of gray-white differentiation. This can be really hard to tell, um, especially um, depending on the CT sequence paradigms your institution uses. Um, so uh, if you want to get a better picture of a, of a DAI, um, you should get an MRI and look at the SWI. So like I mentioned in the last slide, DAI is best diagnosed with MRI, uh, particularly the GRE and the SWI sequences. Um, the SWI in particular will show several regions of uh, small uh, punctate susceptibility artifact at the gray-white junction um, in the corpus callosum and in severe cases the brainstem and, and it'll be surrounded by some flare hyperintensity. So you can see that in the middle image here, those uh, punctate uh, hypo-intensities with the, with the edema around it. Um, gross path pathologic findings um, are going to include deep contusions, multiple petechial hemorrhages, um, uh, particularly involving the cerebral white matter, basal ganglia, uh, upper brain stem as well. As I mentioned in the first lecture, uh, there's a set of guidelines that are developed by the AANS and the Brain Trauma Foundation um, for managing trauma patients because it can be quite complicated. Uh, in order to understand these guidelines, you have to understand also the levels of recommendation and evidence. Um, so uh, the class one evidence is from prospective randomized controlled trials and these are the gold standard um, trials, obviously. Class two evidence, uh, clinical studies in which there's reliable data um, prospectively collected, but it's analyzed retrospectively. And then class three studies are ones that um, are based upon retrospectively collective data, case reviews and reports, and expert 
uh, opinions. Now, um, this class classified data um, gets translated into levels of recommendation for the So now that we talked about the classifications of data that we gather to create these guidelines, let's talk about the corresponding guideline levels uh, to, to these classifications. And particularly, we're going to talk about ICP management and monitoring in uh, severe TBIs. And in the most recent edition, um, the, uh, there's ICP monitoring is recommended for reducing in hospital and two week post injury mortality. Um, and there's only level two and three evidence for this. Um, but the level two evidence is that it should be monitored uh, in salvageable patients with severe TBI and a TCS of between three and eight and an abnormal head CT scan. And then level three uh, guidelines suggest that ICP monitoring is indicated in patients with severe TBI. Uh, normal head CT scan um, if two of these uh, findings are noted on admission, and that's age of greater than 40, uh, unilateral or bilateral posturing, and systolic blood pressure less than 90 on presentation. There's also uh, guidelines, and the new guidelines, there is a suggestion that uh, ICP be maintained less than 22, um, whereas previously uh, the guidelines were just su suggestive that ICP be maintained less than 20 millimeters of mercury, so that's a change. So uh, you made it to the end of the three-part set for um, our TBI lectures. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is not meant to be a comprehensive uh, discussion of everything TBI because that would take hours. Um, however, hopefully it gave you kind of a context of some of these injuries that you're going to see and, and to help better understand them. Um, so here are our references and please follow us on Twitter uh, for more info on future educational content we'll be releasing. See you next time.